we can move right into um, a presentation by I don't know if you want to discuss that or, or move to the uh, presentation, so to speak. My memo dated um, yes, uh, just today, actually. Um, so, any, do you want to? Well, actually, make? your memo does address each one of his qu questions that he had in his letter. Is that correct? Or yes, it does. Different, I guess. So, he said, the, uh, Dean sent me a separate message asking about um, our school cost portion to Carl. Okay, you want to so, go right to that? So first? it's quick and easy. Um, yep. We had looked at a, um, the SORC encouraged me to do a, a shared resources study to determine uh, what, what opportunities might exist for the town and schools department to, sh to share resources. So I had this list of different activities that were um, uh, undertaking and facilities. Um, and so I was able to just cobble that information into this document. So we did it fairly hastily. Mm -hmm. it, uh, Dean's individual memo uh, was directed to me on October 3rd. So this is kind of a quick response. But it, it um, provides some response to, um, to his questions. So generally speaking, I think the, um, the facilities that the town of Concord makes available to the regional high school are listed there. The, <clears throat> the playing, uh, the, the turf field, the BD Center. The uh, Ripley administration building, the Emerson facilities, track uh, fields, and tennis courts, ride out field, Knox Trail, and bus uh, facility. Knox Trail being the office building, uh, the bus facility is the repair shop next, next door. So that's a different thing. Generally speaking, I think that the um, costs, say for Ripley, our portion, I think my understanding is the school department apportions 60% of the cost of, of, of something in the K through 12 system is 60% is charged to the Concord Public School System, 40% to the region, um, which means when 40% is um, charged to the region, 10% is paid by Carlisle. So roughly 10% is what Carlisle's obligation would be uh, for uh, anything that's system-wide. Um, so for my understanding for the Ripley administration building is that the um, cost of electricity and utilities, routine operating costs, cleaning the building, those are shared between CPS and the region. The capital improvement are, are not. Those are solely on Concord. So I think we've spent over a million, perhaps close to a million and a half, in capital improvements on paving the, paving the parking lot, um, you know, improving the building and its interior and so forth. So normally 10% of that, those co capital costs would, would have been the, an obligation of town Carlisle, in my view. Um, and that comes to, um, I guess, comes to focus with the bus facility. Um, in the period when the school transportation building was torn down, on the campus was torn down, and the transportation services uh, were leased from, at one point, two, two locations in Bill Reckon and in Acton, and then ultimately consolidated in Acton, I believe the, re, um, the school department paid something between $100,000 to $125,000 per year to lease that storage space and fueling facilities and care facilities. And uh, I believe the those, that cost of that $100,000 uh, lease was shared in the usual manner, so Carlisle would have contributed $10,000 to, to those expenses. Now that Concord has built a $4 million new bus facility, there's no apportionment of those costs to, to Carlisle. So, um, a question's been asked from time to time. I've had conversations with the superintendent about this. Um, there's no easy way to, to get at that, but this is just a factual report. So again, I think the operating cost for 37 Knox Trail, the office building, mm -hmm. are apportioned, I think, um, equitably. Um, and the operating cost for the bus repair facility, um, again, uh, it's, the capital, it's the capital costs that don't. Um, uh, and the operating costs are done through the school? Correct. Okay. So, and then on, my view on um, services is, is I, I think that we are fortunate to have the regional high school located in our community, so which is a benefit to 
people to want to use the place, want to use the regional high school. It's shorter commute from from our residences than it is from Carlisle, um, and part of the price that you pay for that convenience of having a regional school in your town is you absorb the routine uh, costs that the, the school demands for police services, fire service, roads, and, and all of that. So that's sort of the price we pay for having a building in our town is we plow the streets, we provide the police response, we provide the fire response. Um, so that, that's my perspective, you know, others may disagree. There are a few other things um, there, um, other minor services that, that are provided. The, at one time, the town did provide, uh, did not charge the school department for sand and salt. Um, and, and 10 years ago, some time ago, that, that those costs have been apportioned. So that's indicated there. The fueling, the school department totally pays for its fuel. But the cost of operating the fueling facility, which is minor, it's electricity and maintenance on a, a gas meters and that sort of thing, is, is not covered. But again, it's a minor thing, the use of the compost area from time to time. Um, so the other things are there. One, one significant area is the permit fees. That we normally waive permit fees. So when the police, there's some renovations are happening at the police station or the Harvey Wheeler building, and um, there's a building permit required, I don't require the police chief to pay a fee for the inspection of the building permit and that sort of thing. Because um, that's just taking out of one pocket and putting in the other, in my view. But when it comes to the region, um, to waive a, you know, perhaps a $50,000 permit fee, you know, is a significant amount of money that, that inures to the benefit of the town of Carla. Um, I don't have a strong objection to that when it was, um, in the case of the region, new regional high school, the building permit would have been about $850,000. I understand that Lincoln has charged Minuteman Vogue somewhere around a million dollars for the building permit. Um, and based strictly on a square footage size of the building times a certain dollar amount. Um, in that case of the high school, uh, I negotiated with the school building committee a payment of uh, $100,000. And that was a difficult process, but I thought um, town, the town of Concord staff spent considerable hours um, uh, uh, inspecting that project and, and addressing different issues that came up during a normal construction process. So there was considerable commitment made by the town during that process. So I raised the issue of building permit fees um, for you know, non-town non entities, whether it's be nonprofit groups or, or the region. And um, so, and the select board, I think, uh, ultimately decided that when a permit is uh, in excess of, and I don't recall if it was $30,000 or $50,000, that they would like to discuss that, that situation in particular. So if, if there is an addition, ever put an addition on the high school or, or something that call it, has a substantial building permit charge to the board has to be involved in the discussion. Can I ask a question? Um, sure. You said that because we have this, the high school in our town, it would be normal for us to absorb things like police and fire, right? Do other, like does Lincoln, does Sudbury absorb those costs for the Lincoln Sudbury High School? Do other regional high schools do follow that same protocol? I don't know the answer to that. I know of a few cases where that is the case. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know um, in, in other parts, you know, on Cape Cod and some other which is schools I happen to be familiar with, okay. that the, the town, the host community, picks up the, the standard um, police and fire response. The school resource officer is not a standard response. It's something that is funded exclusively by the town of Concord. The police chief's perspective on that is he really wouldn't want that to be a regional agreement on how police officers used and, um, and, and have to account for that person's time, say, because um, another community paid 25% uh, of the salary, that, that then they get 25% control over how the officer operates. Or if, they, if he's reassigned temporarily to respond to an emergency off campus, if that's where the police chief needs that person to be, he doesn't want to have to account for that. So he, in his view, I think the current arrangement is fine. He, he wouldn't, he's not looking for 10% of the salary to be paid. Um, although you could argue that I think that this, the high school school resource officer is entirely exclusively in the regional high school, right? It doesn't right. provide services for any of the conference schools. So. Again, free service, free police service. Correct. Much as the nonprofits, other the churches and other not tax exempt properties in Concord also, you know, benefit from being here and, and, and don't uh, necessarily pay any taxes. To so the policeman that's dedicated to the high school is paid for by Concord, right? But we didn't go to Carlo and say, will you help? We didn't ask for any approval for them, even though they were going to get some benefit from this. Okay. So that's we don't ask them if they want to pay for this. We just um, do it. I, that's my understanding. Okay. Okay.
Okay. Yeah, I, I have a question. So where does the 10% in the limited cases where you do allocate, where does that come from? It's the, um, if, if it's a, a something for the K through 12 system, such as the superintendent, mm -hmm. it serves the K through 12 system. I believe the school administration divides up those costs 60% for um, the, the K through 8 system, Concord Public Schools, and 40% for the region. And Car Carlisle's population is about 25%. It's um, it's more like 30, 70? 75, 70, 25. 75, 25. So anyway, it's 25 percent of the 40 percent is taxed. So sorry, following on Mary's line of questioning, um, is there a resource out there, maybe an auditor or someone who could give us some guidance as to what constitutes best practice on some of these issues? Or do you have any recommendations? For uh, we, I think we could look into it if you're interested in, if, if there's particular information, um, such as is this, is this arrangement, these arrangements commonplace? Exactly. I, I think without getting an auditor, I think we could do some research and perhaps look at a handful of school districts in our area and yeah. find out what they do. I think that's something we could, we could find out about. So I thought Mary's question was, was a good one, and, and, and I personally would be interested in whether what we're doing is, is considered uh, Common practice. Right. Yeah. Even common doesn't even have to be best. Even common. That's just what our other mm -hmm. regions doing. Yeah. And if we're way out of line on one, then that gives us maybe yes. something else to consider. I agree. Yeah. Okay. I will. <clears throat> it's actually probably be fair. I have a follow-up question about the capital costs. Mm -hmm. If we were to going forward, like I said, maybe put an addition on the high school, and we wanted mm -hmm. Carlisle to help us pay for part of that, what would be the mechanism? Well, in, in the case of the new building, yeah. they, they obviously paid their full share of borrowing in both town and little minus the right. MSBA grant and, and that sort of thing. Um, but so it was the, that was the building permit question. Um, it was at that time, you know, it's, it's, it's a straight square footage yeah. calculation and building permits are pretty expensive. So um, waiving building permits. What permit about like the $300,000 uh, warrant that was pulled from our last special town meeting? If that had been approved here, would that have also? My understanding was they were, they were I, know, I know that they were seeking um, funds from Carlisle as well because they okay. scheduled a special okay. town meeting as well. And, and canceled their special town meeting. So, on the operating cost for, I mean, these are all kind of um, field kind of facilities for the most part. Do you have any idea? Just uh, overall, what the operating costs of those facilities are. Uh, let me see. I know that the, um, what, what kind of on the, what the, what the, on the turf fields, for example, the, the uh, maintenance is paid for by the sports right. groups. The, the sports yeah. groups pay Concord Public Works fifty thousand dollars each year, uh, and that fully covers the cost of maintaining the two artificial turf fields. Um, so, uh, if you looked at Emerson Field, for example. It, it's probably a comparable level of work, so you might be talking the, the um, assistant town manager, Kate Hodges, who's responsible for the BE Center and the recreation operation, said that the cost of providing services to the region at the BE Center is about $50,000. Oh, to the region? region. To, in terms of playing, uh, in terms of oh. the Z classes and the swim and dive team that use the facility. I, I was just looking for the overall cost. So, yeah. um, so then Emerson, there's some costs associated with, you know, our co the cost that it requires to maintain Emerson Field. Um, which is used, the, you know, fair portion of the time by the region. Not, not as much as it used to be now that they have the lower fields redeveloped, but it is still used. Yes. Does Concord Academy um, pay any usage fields for the usage of the school facilities? Yeah. Yeah. Payment that's made. Yes, I think that the, the recreation department, in exchange for access to ba basketball courts and indoor facilities at Concord Academy during the winter months, um, we make available the facilities at Emerson. It's sort of a horse, a horse trade. Correct. Didn't, didn't, uh, Middlesex uh, did actually rent, uh, pay to renovate the track yes. at Emerson yes. Field because we allow have allowed em, uh, Middlesex School to have their track uh, team practice and meets at. And, 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 so and that's also their way of. Um, it's not a pilot. Right, that's correct. They, but, they right, so there's there's this two tiered in that there's a gift to the there's a gift, yes. specified gift to the town. They do it for things other than athletics. They prefer capital and, um, yeah, costs like that. Yeah, and some of it's about facilities that their students and faculty use, and sometimes it's not. But yeah. it's 
um, that one is a bit of a hybrid. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, they actually, in the last a few gifts that Middlesex has provided, they went through our warrant in the spring and saw a capital, um, the, the Emerson track uh, that we were requesting funds for, yeah. and the public safety radios, if you remember those from a few years ago. They picked both of those out and said, we'll, we'll pay for those. Um, in the case of the radios, I think it was $250,000, yeah. so they said they, they, they did it over. Yeah. And uh, they did a sidewalk, yeah. so um, unrelated to that. But it did, that's a sort of a public benefit that Middlesex also paid. Concrete Academy has also made improvements. They, they made some investments in our emergency operations center and the police fire station, so they also okay. provide income. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have one, one other question. So just going back to the, the building permit, so we paid 800000 and they paid a hundred, or you negotiated it down to the, the Build, the standard um, building permit for that of structure of that uh, size square footage would have been about eight hundred and fifty thousand okay, dollars. Okay, but that's and, not what you're and, um, the, uh, I was asked to waive it entirely, and I wasn't comfortable waiving it entirely, given the amount of staff time it took to review the plans and do the inspection. So we agreed that the last hundred thousand dollars in the project that would be paid would be the building permit. And Concord paid it, or was she? The region. The region. The, paid. the yeah, the region paid it. So Carlisle and, paid a piece of it. And the state would not pay, the MSBA grant would not pay for a building permit. Interesting. No? Okay. Okay. Thank you. 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 Uh, so now on to um, the, uh, I think it's an eight page uh, memo from you, and I apologize for the 26th year in a row of uh, getting this to you just on the day of the doctor meeting. It's not by intent, and obviously, I just want to keep this on. So, uh, so in, in response to each of Dean's questions, um, uh, I think they were Dean's, right? Um, uh, my response is fine. I won't re read this to you, but I'll just hit the highlights, if you will. Uh, the comment that he's asked about is current status of the current budget. And I'm not aware, nor is Kerry, that um, <coughs> there any accounts that are in, in danger at all, other than the legal services account that we discussed at the special town meeting. Um, we hope that, that, um, that we can get through that without having a problem, but that the additional funds from, uh, from last Monday you know, will be helpful. Um, there are, is uh, one thing that uh, John Harris has suggested, with, uh, mentioned to you, is the budget presentation itself needs to change. Um, our auditing firm has said that we really should be speaking of best practices. Not our, our, the article for the town budget simply discusses the general fund that it doesn't talk about the other contributions from the light fund and other funds that support. So John's provided a, a pie chart showing the, the, the treasurer collector's operation there, and the, the large um, dock chunk is um, the general fund support of 289,000 for the treasurer collector. But that um, that operation also benefits the parking the parking fund, the BD center, solid waste, sewer, water, and light funds. So each of those enterprises, the revolving funds, contributes and. Um, our, and we've always documented in the budget book, you saw similar pie charts like this, but it's never been in the warrant or um, really uh, uh, publicly dis discussed at town meeting. Um, but it, it, it seems like our, our auditors are requiring the town meeting vote to approve the budget with everything in there so that town meeting has sanctioned the full, in this case, I think it's 500 and $7,000 for the treasurer collector's operation, not just the 289 that the general fund is So um, I think it was helpful John suggested that we mention that to you. So the budget will look a little different this, this year. It's no additional general fund um, su um, support or anything like that, but we're going to be asking the town meeting to vote on a, a significantly higher number that reflects everything. Okay. Um, uh, service status and anticipated changes in the next one to five years. Um, my view is that, that, that we're offering the town current uh, uh, program of services that we provide from the libraries, the police department, the public works uh, reflects the needs and desires of the town as they have voted on those uh, programs over the years. Um, and the favorable feedback that the, those departments get each, uh, every time we do the citizen survey, which is every other year, the, the response is generally that they're satisfied with the service and they feel there's good value for, the, for what they pay. It's not a unanimous uh, agreement, but generally the majority of folks feel they're, they're getting good value for their tax dollars. Um, some trends that we want to keep in mind, or no surprise to you, is the, um, the aging population in Concord, 
Um, Sudbury has a substantially significant younger population. A lot of people moved in and saw their school age population grow in some other communities, I think Brookline. Some communities are experiencing uh, growth in their school age population. So far, ours has been pretty, pretty le you know, level. Um, and uh, so what we're seeing instead is, a, is a aging, folks aging in place and, and requiring some services. So we, we, uh, the town has supported in recent years augmenting the support at the Council on Aging, van drivers, and public health nurses, and some other things like that. So um, economic development is something that was mentioned in the, the comprehensive long-range plan that was published in July. Um, business partnership is also mentioned. It would be helpful to have um, someone to support um, businesses, uh, both uh, to help visitors that come here and are looking for information about what, where to visit, where to eat, that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and also a, 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 a position to work with as, as Lexington has and Acton and some of the communities around us. Businesses are thinking of locating here, someone to help them through the permitting process and to encourage them and sort of sell the town. Um, I, I, I requested that last year, you might recall, as a quarter position or part-time position to get us started. Um, we, um, and that what didn't, didn't make it in my final budget presentation, but something that you've, you've heard about before in you know, the long range plan mentioned that something we should really be trying to do is to promote business. Um, the um, assistant town manager is proposing that, um, that, that we create such a position and that be funded through the visitor center operations. That she believes that we, she can spin off enough money to, um, to fund that position. Um, through the sales of maps, and, uh, visitor services, and that sort of thing. So we're going to, I'll explore that further. So you won't see that in my list of things to do, but there is a proposal that um, the position would be funded through the Rec Revolving Fund, which is where the visitors center uh, operation is funded through there. The and current, the current, the current the, not the one that you're proposing. That's, that, that's okay. correct. So the, um, the Chamber of Commerce was operating the visitor center up until two years ago, and we were providing a $15,000 subsidy to them to help them keep going. Um, and uh, they proposed an in increase, uh, a significant a doubling of that amount one year. And when we said that was <coughs> difficult, they said, well, we, don't, we can't afford to do this and lose, lose money. So we took it over two years ago, um, broke even with the rec department, assistant town manager supervising the rec department, providing the um, uh, actual on the ground operation. They broke even the first year, so the $15,000 subsidy went away. And I think this past year they made uh, $5,000 or something like that. So, um, so she feels that um, by expanding some of the programs, um, she would be able to create a position that would be funded through that process rather than future fund support. But it will be achieving, I think, a goal <coughs> that we've been talking about for a few years. Chris, when you say they made $5,000, they covered their operating budget and netted $5,000 yes. in addition? And that was from? From um, tours. They have, uh, Ask me, Tom. I, I know one of the things is tour. They have uh, tours. Uh, there's uh, opportunities we're missing out on. The Liberty Ride that used to come here, um, there wasn't anybody from the visitor center to meet the, the people that were being dropped off, so they were just kind of wandering around. Um, and so they, the Liberty Ride stopped dropping people off at the visitor center. They still drop them off at the grid, the North Bridge, and I think the museum and other locations. But that was that's a revenue stream that could be up to twenty thousand uh, dollars if if we provide some service to those visitors. Mm -hmm. uh, they're willing to pay and contribute. they pay to get on that Liberty Ride, um, and, uh, and that's an opportunity. So there's a lot of things yeah. like that that, uh, that we can be doing to both support visitor services and, and not have to pay for. Um, so more on that the next time I see you. Um, if not, so I'm uh, sorry, but was it the Chamber of Commerce that was running it before? said something about why businesses are struggling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they, you know, they have a conflicted role because they have um, members that aren't involved in visitor services, you know, that aren't restaurants and, and uh, <coughs> hotels and that sort of thing, and they put certain demands on the Chamber of Commerce, and the visitor services was put certain demands, and they, they felt they, they couldn't do everything, so that they got out of the visitor services thing. Business such. Um, and um, this is significant. It used to be $400,000 carry the um, bed tax and the meals tax, uh, I think combined were you know, getting close to $500,000. So visitor services generate a lot of revenue for us. I guess every meal that's eaten in the restaurant isn't from the visitors, but there's a significant amount of revenue that's coming in from those visitors, um, bed tax and, and meals tax. Um, the new public parks is a, is a, a 
um, it's something yeah, well, I, I just back on sir. the uh, four hundred thousand that, you, that you're proposing here for a visitor center in West Concord. Did that come out of a um, long range yeah, plan? I think it's in the long referenced in the long range plan. It came out of the West Concord study, uh, West West Concord um, advisory committee, and others uh, interested in West Concord have been saying. It particularly related to restrooms, is that currently there's no public facilities um, available, and we really should have some restrooms for. Are there restrooms at Rideout? At Rideout, yes, they are. But that's not really downtown. So if somebody's um, walking around West Concord Center, um, you wouldn't want to send them to Rideout to use the facilities. If possible, we can make, we can, if they're on a bicycle or something, we can make it known to them. And I think that those facilities get used pretty substantially by the many visitors at, at Rideout. But if you're at the, on, on the bike trail next summer, riding the bike trail, and you, you need to use the restroom, then it's kind of looking for it. So, um, and that's been, it's, it's been proposed. Um, there are a couple of buildings. Um, but purchasing a building in West Concord is going to be expensive. Um, there's limited options. But the idea of create, having some space that has both restrooms and a place for information, we're not thinking that it would be a staff place, but that people could go and get some pamphlets and information about businesses in West Concord. So, so this 412 800 uh, thousand is, is something that you're going to have on the warrant this coming? Uh, it's it is sorry it's not, on in the debt plan um, as attached to the document here tonight is uh, oh. it is included. Uh, but, but I can't say that we have a building identified. We have a couple of possibilities, but we don't have any specific uh, agreement with anybody. You wouldn't build one. You. We, we don't haven't identified a site where we could. Um, you know, one possibility, one question is if we probably will have, we almost certainly will have restrooms at the Jerome Land of um, Morris Pond Park. Yes. That's pretty close, certainly yeah. for cyclists that are riding yeah, through. Cyclists, you know, um, so it's yeah. Right. Right. So it's not yeah. ideal. Yeah. Um, and we don't want if, we don't want all the riders to come into one location in the center of town. Ideally, we'd have multiple. Uh, rest facilities along the way so they don't just all congregate in one particular location on, on a busy day. You so said the one in the center is mostly for tourists, right? Whereas the one in West Concord, you're targeting more cyclists, not tourists. Because I don't think there's a lot of tourists in West Concord. It is, uh, it, fair enough. There's not as not nearly as many, no. But there, so there are some I'm visitors. Sure want it to be a tourist place. Um, there, um, <laughs> there is a cultural district, a recently created West Concord Junction Cultural District, where they are trying to encourage people to walk around and uh, that where you're required to have a cultural district, you have some have some performing arts, you have to have restaurants, and you have to have other cultural amenities. So there is a hope that there will, will increase. They don't want to make it a big major tourist destination, but they, I think the businesses in West Concord are hoping to get more walking traffic. So, business. Um, so that's, uh, oh, and the new public parks, um, we mentioned uh, both the, the Jiro Park, there'll be a request for Community Preservation Act funding for the Warner's Pond Park, and then the White Pond um, uh, gift, we hope is consummated this uh, winter in December, January, and uh, um, we will, uh, there is a need for some facilities improvement, it, does not, it doesn't have to be done, it isn't a safety issue or anything like that, but so it could be deferred if necessary. We have some funds uh, from the gift, and we have some grant opportunities, so, um, uh, but those are areas where we will need to both spend some capital money, I think, and some, have some operating um, expenses as well. Collective bargaining. Um, the police contract was recently settled. Uh, it's, we're still writing it up, actually, it hasn't been signed yet, but uh, that, that contract is in place. Uh, the dispatch contract that expired this past June is in the under negotiation. Fire agreement is settled, library is settled, and Public Works is a new union, and we've been negotiating with them for two and a half years. Um, and we're now in mediation, so it's, it's dragged out a bit. Um, I do think our recent wage um, settlements have been reasonable within the two and a half percent range. Um, we've granted s slightly more than that for the public safety folks to get some language out of the contract that allowed us some greater flexibility in managing the operations, but if they've been in that neighborhood. Um, relative to employment conditions, and, uh, unemployment is very low. It's, uh, the things are competitive. We've had some real trouble finding uh, anyone um, to, to uh, apply for the positions of like the financial manager of the light plant. Um, that was a real, we finally did hire someone. Uh, it was somebody that uh, Kerry suggested we contact because we didn't get um, many responses at all to our um, advertisements and we went, I think, for almost two years. And the light plant financial management is very important. So, we, uh, so that was a tough position. 
um, to fill the assistant light plant director. It left in, in June, I think it was, and we got a meager response to that. So highly technical positions like that are, can be difficult to, to fill. We've advertised for um, four times, I think, for the highway division's operations manor, managers. So somebody who's good at managing both operations and people um, is, are challenging to find, and, and, and engineers are hard. So, so we are experiencing some, some difficulty hiring positions. Other, uh, when we advertise for the library, for police and fire, we get you know, more applications than you can imagine. So there, um, there's some jobs that are uh, you know, relatively, a lot of competition, a lot of cho choice, and some positions that are difficult to fill. Um, and my, uh, my recent salary increases have been in the 2.5% uh, range. Uh, HR director is suggesting we consider a 3% adjustment. Um, yeah, given the competitive uh, labor market, one of our cha significant challenges is the percent of employer share of the health insurance, which you've heard about before, and, but continues to be an issue for us. We pay, on average, about 57% of the cost of health insurance. Uh, when a family plan total cost was $3,000 or $4,000, um, the, the difference between the 57% we pay and the 75 or 80% that Lexington pays was not a lot of money. But now when a family plan costs $20,000 or so, um, if, if Lexington is paying substantially more than we are, it's really, it's a, it's a consideration that employees give um, in, in, in coming over here. And our existing employees are aware that other communities, where Carlisle is similar, at, at, at similar um, at, as we do and a few other communities do, but most other towns pay uh, in, in the 65 to 75% range for health insurance. So um, again, to remain competitive uh, in, the, in a competitive <coughs> labor market, we may want to consider um, a, a slightly higher adjustment. Um, and that, that increase, many people employees complain that their entire raise disappears with a 10% health insurance rate increase. It, 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 after taxes, what's left is almost entirely dedicated to, to health insurance, depending on what level of the salary scale you're at. Chris, is, is there a short explanation as to how we got as low as 57 percent under. We've just always been at that level. There's always been pressure to to change. But again, there was a time when uh, health insurance was you, you know three, four, five thousand so, dollars. So the we always we we consciously put quite a while ago. Uh, it was <laughs> fair enough. Uh, but we always consciously put money into the salaries to be competitive with salaries and not into the. Um, health insurance, I mean, one of the justifications um, was that about two-thirds of our employees take advantage of the health insurance, whereas all of the employees get the salary adjustment, so it was a little bit more equitable. Um, so, uh, and, and, but uh, other communities um, I have tended to, um, moving, they're moving down. You know, many of them pay 90% or 85%, and, and, and it was painful for them to, to have these 10% rate increases, so 75% is becoming more common. Do we have high turnover here in Concord? Pardon? Do we have high turnover? High turnover in, in employment yes. positions? No, I, I wouldn't say so. Um, for police and fire are very slow. It's rare for people to leave to take uh, a job in another community. They do retire. Um, other positions are more entry level jobs. Um, people do move on to take a promotion elsewhere, like our town engineer just left to take a, uh, a ch an engineering job elsewhere, shorter commute or, or a promotion. But, um, I'm just suggesting we, we, we have, I would say we have low term. Yeah, I'm suggesting that there might be other advantages to working in this town that compensate for the fact that mm -hmm. health insurance fair, might fair be. Enough. So one thing, we'll hear the same thing about the low contribution to health insurance when we get to the schools. Because right. schools are on the same uh, plan as the as town. And the high school is, is pretty much the same rate, I believe, um, as, as the town yes. also. Although it won't necessarily have to be. So you will hear it, and we, we hear it, and we continue to resist it. We do uh, try to provide a wage, a wage compensation, as well as uh, provide a, a, a good, comfortable, welcoming uh, work environment where you get trained, you have current technology, you have other attributes, and the, uh, the health insurance cost is just one of the considerations among many. Sure. Well, and, you know, the reality is that the Globe just a big article that this there's a public sector phenomenon too where people are seeing all of their salary increases being swallowed by the rising cost of the insurance premium that they pay. And whether it's a higher deductible or more that's coming out, that you know it's a burden that's shared by 
the taxpayers who don't work in the public sector too. It's right. you know it's common to all of humanity. Yep. Yep. So you know we share their pain. <laughs> Uh, fair enough. One selling point I, I refer to is the OPEB. Um, we, uh, you know, it, it, also private sector employers don't get um, post-employment health insurance paid, whereas public retirees do at 50 percent, um, and uh, that's an, uh, an, obli an ongoing obligation that had been unfunded. But Concord had, is one of the leaders in funding that future health care cost for retirees, and so that's a selling point. Also, I think that some of our money has gone into funding the OPEB. Um, so, and, and that I don't recommend that we change our health care contribution until we're in much better shape with the old one, old and closer to fully funded. That's my opinion. Okay. okay. Just since we're on the topic of OPEB, one of the questions I've asked uh, is whether, um, obviously, given the trajectory of that cost, the question uh, comes up is it sustainable? And the question I've asked is is there anything that can be done to bend the cost curve in? far future years to make that more manageable uh, years out. I might defer to Kerry on that. Kerry, do you want, do you want to join me here? I, I guess I framed it in the, so. in the context of is, it, is a new hire today <laughs> and say the same OPEB deal as one hired maybe 10 or 15 years ago and, and is, that a, is that an unreasonable question to ask? Um, I don't think that's an unreasonable question to ask. I think that's something that we're looking at, whether or not we have the ability to do that. Um, I think what I would, how I would respond to your first question is, I think the steps that we have taken to implement the high deductible plans will have a positive impact on the OPEP liability. And we have that liability valued as of June 30 of each year. We don't have our, our new valuation yet. I am hoping that when we receive that, that we'll see a little bit of a, um, a positive move in that direction. And then when we do it again in another year, that we'll see even an even more positive move in that direction. At one point, we were thinking that if we ever achieve full funding of the retirement system, then any funds that we had been allocating for retirement could go to OPEB. Um, it's a little bit more off in the, just, uh, off in the future, 2029, when we're currently targeted to be fully funded with the um, retirement system. I don't know how the stock market did today. Um, but, um, <laughs> Down a lot. <laughs> but uh, so at some point, that might be a, a source of revenue 10, 10 years out or so where if we do achieve full funding, that we can reallocate, reprogram those retirement funds towards the open plan. So it's off in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. I have a question. Um, so a lot of the retirees are on, on Medicaid. Uh, yes, I have yeah, over 65. Yeah. Um, and pay Medicare premium. Of course, health, Insure, regular, you know, health insurance premiums are, are rising. Um, how would would uh, on on terms of OPEB would increasing Medicare premiums um, have a detrimental effect on our uh, ability to cover the uh, OPEB liability? Boy, this is a tricky. Because you know that there there is that train coming into the station or something. So yeah. the town offers um, Medicare supplement plans. Yeah. And so the, the va that would be factored into the liability. Um, so increasing, are you saying an, an increase in Part A or Part B costs? Right, yeah, you pay a premium for that. Well, so the, the benefits and so if that premium were to increase, right. then presumably that our OPEM have to cover that. So and, and, and you know there's this issue about Medicare. I mean Medicare funding is an even more uh, dicey situation than Social Security, and uh, you know, if they were to really raise the premium, deal with that issue. So the, the retiree pays those premiums. The town shares in the um, the, the premium of the supplement. Okay. So the town, the OPEB, is not even covering 50% of the Medicare premium? Right. It's, oh, okay. it's, it's covering, uh, it's Just valuing the, the benefits okay. that are offered under the supplement plan. Okay.
So it's like in the private sector too, right? In the private sector, I don't think you know. Yeah, they don't get it. No, yeah. Yeah. but you, you, pay, you pay your own premiums for part of your fee. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. That's, so that's not any different. I don't know. Yeah, too many people. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Paying the premiums while they're employed, though. So, yeah. Uh, so I am still on page three. Um, I did, and I, I talked about the salary adjustment. So the last two paragraphs in the, in the middle of the page there re refers to the Massachusetts Pay Equity Act, which took effect on July 1st, um, requires employers, public employers, to pay um, equitably relative to gender. Um, so, uh, and we're in the process of going through our um, pay classification we group people, in, and similarly, you've seen in the warrant the, the different job titles. And we classify people based on what we think of the responsibilities, and to some extent on the market. Um, and uh, the Pay Equity Act says market doesn't matter. Um, you, can, you can't. If you need, if you need to hire engineers, and you're, you know, paying, you need to pay both your women engineers and your men engineers equitably. But similar, they look at similar jobs and say a building, the building commissioner. That's a lot like an engineer, uh, safety related, structural. Um, you should be paying that position equitable to the engineers, and so so and other compare other positions to one another. And if we find a male dominated um, or female dominated, we may have to make some equity. Then the, the equitable adjustment is you increase somebody whoever's low. It's not that you reduce somebody's pay; you have to increase somebody's pay. So there are we, the HR directors going through that personally. We haven't used a consultant. Um, she generally feels, I think, we're in pretty good shape, but there probably will be some pockets of positions where we leave that have to start hiring people in at a higher level or maybe adjust some people's pay to be sure that they're equitable. So that's a, that's a kind of a wild card for, uh, for us that just, just started um, and we're, we're new. I think we're being more active, proactive about implementing the law than some other places and just waiting to see what happens. It's only prospective, though. It doesn't... Correct. I don't think it is retroactive. I mean, and it doesn't kind of retire these in Correct. No. Uh, and then I mentioned the, minim the minimum wage law uh, that had the Massachusetts minimum wage law eventually gets the minimum wage up to $15 an hour in 2023. Municipalities are exempted, but we generally try to comply because van hiring behind van drivers or camp counselors or library pages for below minimum wage would have basically been able to get any of those people. I think, would pay. So that's a, another consideration that it, it won't be a big impact for us this coming year, but in, in the future, um, some of our low cost positions will have to be compensated at a higher level. Uh, uh, question number four uh, was funding levels, highlight any programs that I think should, should continue, but adjustment in funding um, might, might be necessary. Pu public parks, uh, we, we just acquired the Jerome Land and hope to improve it and ma make it uh, a park that people can walk to from West Concord or bike to on Bruce Freeman Rail Trail and it'll be a enjoyable place it's connected to uh, conservation trails and lots of open space. Um, and but we will we do expect to uh, build some facilities may, and hopefully you know, maybe some make some boating available fishing um, uh, and uh, a playground so uh, and there'll be some costs associated with both the capital improvements and the maintenance similarly white pond we're, is, we're receiving as a gift but it needs some improvements and then there'll be some ongoing maintenance. so I, I mentioned that uh, as well um, the uh, second paragraph there's the fire chief is requesting sorry Chris just one second on on, yeah. on Jerome is that considered just a summer facility? No, I, I imagine there'd be cross country skiing and there is. You know, other you know ice fishing, ice fishing and, yeah, other other activities. Hockey. So, like, you know, hockey yeah. uh, so the, the fire chief doesn't encourage <laughs> yeah. I'd rather see the skate at Emerson Field. They've been uh, snow blowing the <laughs> pond for so years. So there'll be park street parking and easy access and so I guess my question is would the parking lot be plowed yeah, accessible uh, uh, in the winter? Would, yep, I, it would I would expect okay. that. Okay, great thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Will there have to be, will there have to be uh, security people or anybody to safety no, people? No, I, I don't expect that. Because it's no, a water I, facility. And not. Um, I think we would post no lifeguard on duty at times. You know, in the off season. And and, and actually, we and I mentioned originally when we envisioned acquiring the Giro property, we did talk about having a beach and a bathing um, facility. But it was going to be very expensive. We would have to dredge the pond, bring in sand. That grade changes substantially. It was going to be difficult to, to um, but worth the try until the white pond opportunity came along. 
So um, it isn't that we're going to you know, not invest in Giro. I think we will, but I, the focus might be more on, on watercraft and uh, fishing than on swimming. Um, and, uh, but as, and White Pond has had some trouble over the years with the lifeguard chairs getting thrown in the water, a little bit of vandalism, picnic tables floating away. Uh, so we'll, we, will have, we don't expect to have um, guards or anything like that, but we may have to do some spot checking or, or take some you know, proactive measures to protect our equipment. Uh, let's see. Fire Chief, uh, uh, paragraph four there on page three, uh, paragraph two, excuse me, is, is looking to um, fund the second ambulance, staff the second ambulance 24 seven. Right now that ambulance in West, West Front Fire Station is um, staffed 12 hours a day, um, seven days a week. Um, so during the daytime hours and not in the evening. So in the evening, if there is a medical emergency, it's the ambulance in Concord Center that goes to the Mews or any other um, West Concord location. It takes a little bit longer to get there. We, in fact, we may they, they, uh, have the active or neighboring community respond, might, might respond quicker, particularly if our primary ambulance is, is tied up. Um, so the fire chief think it would be improve the service in West Concord to staff at 24 seven. That requires hiring uh, four additional firefighters um, and, and, um, and he, uh, we do have the news, uh, so I call it the news stabilization fund, but it's called the emergency response stabilization fund that was set up to provide public safety, uh, to address public safety issues, um, particularly in West Concord. Um, so that's a, he's got a proposal for how to, uh, how to utilize uh, those, some of those funds to gradually move into the general fund support for those five, uh, four, four firefighters. Uh, he also is requesting that because there have been uh, four firefighters added, I think five years ago, and now another four firefighters, that's more people that need supervision, he's requested to uh, increase the number of lieutenants. So we had, had one more lieutenant on each group, so that's four lieutenants, and there's some additional costs associated with that as well. So you'll see, um, just, uh, you'll see that request. The police chief uh, has renewed his request for additional staffing, which you saw last year. I wasn't able to provide the funding for it, but he, he's mentioned the school resource officer, which we talked about in a uh, special town meeting, but that one, his hope is to have that on an ongoing basis. Uh, but he would also like two other police officers, similar to his request last year, a detective to assist with the opioid uh, problem, and a daytime uniformed officer to deal with the, you know, the calls that just keep increasing for services. Um, the capital program. Sorry, quick question on. Sure. How, how big is the opioid? It's 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 there. We have had you know one or two fatalities. Um, some of, and and a few more away from Con of Concord folks that were away at college or away elsewhere uh, that have passed away. I think we had a couple of we had a couple of saves with the Narcan being deployed, but not like ma many other communities, but more urban communities that have a real serious problem. But it's it's there. We have people that are are overdosing and addicted. Um, and uh, um, there's concern about young people, younger, younger people getting addicted to. Did, sorry, just regression to the White Pond. Um, did, am I correct in, in, in recalling that the, the sticker fee or the membership fee will be roughly half of what the previous uh, Pond Association cost was? There's two models, as I mentioned at town, uh, town meeting, that um, the, the White Pond, um, Current operators of White Pond, White Pond Associates feel like if we just use the, their model, have it charge at $300 or $325 a year to 500 families that will pay for the lifeguards and the trash removal and everything we need, um, and it works. Um, I'm, in, I'm interested in um, the approach that's used on co at coastal communities where any, ready, any resident of the town can buy a beach sticker, um, might be $40 or $50. Um, and you can go any time you want, but on the hot, hot days when everybody wants to go, you might not be able to park. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm interested in exploring that. I think at town meeting I was candid that I'm not sure which is the way to go. To me, to make it available for as many people as possible, at least some of the time, would be preferable to limiting it to, to 500 families or you know, have a, a limited number of families. We have 7,000 households uh, in Concord, so. I, I guess I was just asking, um, curious as to, as to what the justification was, we're, we're in a sense conceding an operating loss for the next couple of years based on... I do think it's similar to the Chamber of Commerce where the assistant town manager is being conservative. She she said, I want to continue to get the $15,000 subsidy that the Chamber of Commerce was, and then she broke even the first day. I, I think the same thing is going to happen. We're going to have swimming lessons. There's just a few ideas on how to raise some revenue using the beach. and um, But to be conservative, I'm, I'm projecting 
We, we asked them to secure $30,000 for the first year of operation. I hope, I'm, I'm proposing 20 uh, for the second year, and then um, uh, thereafter it dim diminishing. So that's my hope. Okay. Uh, so the capital program, uh, is that's, I think John's provided a summary there of uh, the capital outlay. We do spend about $2 million, 2% uh, of the operating budget on capital equipment, such as vehicles and computers and sidewalk construction. Um, the general fund debt uh, list, I provided you the projects that we're recommending for the coming town meeting. The enterprise, as I mentioned there, we don't talk about that much in this conversation. Um, excluded debt. Uh, there are two major debt projects that I can see coming down the horizon in the next uh, five years or so. One is the new middle school. They're actively pursuing state funding for that, um, and it's a significant uh, cost. Um, and then in 2017, the town uh, voted to support provide funding for a comprehensive municipal facility study. Um, that study is a uh, consultant's been hired. This consultant is actively um, working on the study to, to quantify our needs for space, our needs for space perhaps over 20 years, and to look at uh, ways in which we could uh, consolidate offices and have uh, more sustainable practices. We have, we have a far-flung operation. We have a lot, of build, a lot of people in a lot of buildings that sometimes have to get together and meet. They're sitting in traffic. Uh, to get, try to get to meetings. Um, so I think a, a central municipal office building might be a more efficient. Um, and uh, we also, so that's a, something that we'd like to discuss. The new public, a new public <coughs> safety complex um, uh, is something that the, the police fire station was in the 1960s vintage, and it wasn't really well built at the time. We find continuously finding things that don't work and problems with it. So um, the police chief has requested more space, the fire chief, uh, he might be looking to have another police station somewhere else and, and turn the, the rest of the building over to the fire department. That's one concept. Um, so we'll be discussing that. And then the public works complex on Kai's Road needs modernization. That's 1950s vintage. We've, we've kept it up well. But most communities around us have their vehicles under cover in the wintertime. It's, it's hard on the vehicles when they've been out in the, you know, 10 degree weather or whatever to try to start them and it, it, it's, it's hard on the vehicle so they, they last longer if they're under in, in, in a garage as you find in Lexington and Sudbury and Western communities around us. Um, so uh, that's a lot of construction that would have to be phased over time. There will be a big community dialogue on it but I think we'll have a report that will tell us what our needs are and we'll make some suggestions uh, later in, in the spring. So, so Chris, um on the uh, on all these construction projects, uh, where do things stand on our proposal for a permanent building committee? I think Mr. McCain um, has it on the select board's agenda for the 29th, so not this coming Monday, but two weeks after that. Okay. It'll be a preliminary conversation, a draft, a review of Mr. Tarpey's uh, letter and the draft committee charge, and I have no idea how the board feels about it, but, but we'll have the conversation. Uh, OPEB, at the bottom of the page, we heard, uh, there were some comments on uh, uh, what the requirement, what the requirement um, is, and uh, John Harris has provided a summary of uh, what our costs are, what our obligations are. Um, and uh, at the final paragraph there, as shown, the um, contributions were $56,000 short of our uh, obligations, so therefore, um, the contribution was increased by $217,000. Uh, this December will have a new number, and chances are the OPEP obligation is going to go up, so we see an increase there. So that comes off the top before you distribute money for town budgets. You know, that's one of the obligations that comes off the top. Um, so it's running about $200,000? So what? The additional the increase, increase in OPEP? We have to put a it looks like it was 156 if we go back and look at 2017 and then. The underfunding was 156. Right. Yeah. I, I, I can look at it. We'll go through it after, okay. after okay. this. Yes, it's 3.47 in the bank or more than that. Are those the assets? Are those the trust fund assets, 3.4? The trust fund assets are approximately $18 million. Oh. So the contributions are the premiums that are paid in during the year and also the contributions that go separate from that which the town contributes as the employer. 
into the trust fund. So that about half, 50% is the premiums that are paid in the employer point a portion, and half that is a general fund subsidy to that fund. And, and all of that has grown over the years. From, Through investments. Yeah. yeah, so if we put in three and a half million and the, and the employees have put in three and a half million, that's all going to 18 million. Is that basically? The, um, John, could you, could you come yeah, up? Yeah, the microphone. Review the audience. Um, so to, to meet our arc, or what they call uh, a modified ARC, which is a net OPEB cost, is 3.6 million. So that for it to, to meet our, our liability and our payments, we need to, our cost is 3.6 million. What we pay in is 1.6 from the premiums. And then the cash contribution was 1.4. And so we get the total cash with the enterprise of 3.4. And so we're slightly short. Um, it's not a large number, but because we were short um, in the last valuation, which was last uh, 2017, that we have increased the contribution that the town puts in so that we make up that shortfall. And if we were just paying as you go, you just paid the pain of 1.6 million, not the 1.4. Exactly. Many communities are just paying, doing a pay as you go arrangement, not setting any money aside for future and, obligations. Uh, and this could be the net would have obligation. How does that compare with the assets in the OPEP fund? What is the relationship between those? So the relationship with of that is that there is a um, accrued um, annual, there's accrued actually accrued liability, and there's actually accrued assets. And then the difference between it is the unfunded portion. And it's probably approximately, and I'll be happy to have Carrie help me out with this, it's approximately 30 million of liability and approximately 16 or 17 million of assets at the moment. Yeah, we are awaiting our. 630-18 valuation, but as of 630-17, we were around 30% funded. Okay. So what is the $7 million figure that we see at the bottom? That is because we started with a not funding the OPEP cost. And so that's the amount that the, the difference between the net OPEP obligation that has not been funded over the years once we started making making this this model. So what we should do is pay more than our net OPEP, uh, the change in the net OPEP obligation, that should be a number that we can pay down this, um, the cumulative net OPEP obligation. It, it's another way of saying that that's the amount we need to catch up to our be fully funded. Exactly. Thank you. To, so to be funded under the requirements, not to hit the 30 not, million. Not to hit the 30 it's million. Different yeah. things, right. Right. Very different. Very different. Right. Things, right. Yeah. But, but we are gradually, we are so getting. Fund, fully funded is less than the 30 million approved liability? We are, what this will yes. do, uh, what this will do is if we meet the the annual OPEP cost, we will gradually pay off the 30 million. Um, and so that is the, if, if we're zero in our net OPEP obligation, we will gradually pay off the 30 million, but we need to gradually, we need to pay off the, what you were saying is the, the cumulative that we have still in deficit. But we are catching up. So we are catching up. So, so the funding ratio is about 30%, we think. And do we have a target for where that might be based on what we think we have to contribute over the next three to 10 years? Is that the way to look at it? So we, what is our, we'll be fully funded in what, what year? I thought I heard Carrie say we're about 30% funded. Right, currently. 30% funded. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think it's we're actually using high a, a 2040 uh, 
uh, funding mm. schedule right. for OPEB right now. <coughs> um, OPEB is it's it's different than. Uh, and I don't want to get too far into this because I'll be over my head before <laughs> before I know it. But um, we're just in, beginning to enter into conversations with our actuary, and perhaps we'll be hiring an investment advisor to talk about the the funding schedule and funding policies because this is different. This liability is different than the retirement liability because there will be a retirees make a contribution to this benefit. So where you're trying to get close to 100% funded for retirement to consider yourself fully funded, you don't have to get as close with OPEB to be considered fully funded. And that's something that we need to begin to explore. So where, where we will be as of 63018, uh, something over 30%, the market was gangbusters over the last 12 months. Um, we, we made, we met our arc for all intents and purposes. So I can't say would, will we be 32% or 33%, but we certainly are making progress. I think the, the one thing to, to point out, and I'm glad John explained this chart because I just don't even look at this chart. It, it's very hard to understand. But when we put together um, what we estimate our annual required payment. So for fiscal 20, we're putting together or making an estimate of what we believe we need to contribute based on the valuation as of 63017. So when when he's mentioning in here that we were short, we used a 6302015 valuation to put together the estimate for for the payment for fiscal 17, and then when the new valuation came in, there was a difference. So I just want to make sure everybody understands. The, the intention is that we are fully budgeting the ARC based on the valuation that is available to us when we're putting the budget together. But things happen, the market changes, we might make changes in some of the assumptions, and that impacts the next valuation. So we do a two-year time lag between the data that you're using and what you're, with the numbers in the budget? We do, yes, we do. Um, and, and I don't think, based on our budget cycle, I don't, I don't think we ever span that because we're, um, you know, we'll, we'll be on top of the actuary to get the report by Thanksgiving more likely by the end of December for, for 6.30. And so we can't get him. He does great work. We love his work. He's very helpful. We can't get him to work any faster. Um, we, can't, we can't get that valuation ready for this budget cycle. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I ask there was a comment that uh, the employees contributing to this fund they, employees don't contribute. Not contributing to the fund, but contributing, they continue, they pay a portion of the benefit that is provided. At the time of, during, at the time. When in retirement, you're, pay, you're paying something towards your retiree health insurance benefit. So it's different than your retire, your pension benefit that you're not paying anything, you're just collecting. Thanks, John. Uh, so that's OPEB. Uh, town meeting directives. Um, a question about uh, citizen petition articles and um, uh, provide insight into how citizen petition articles might influence budget development and that sort of thing. Uh, my response there is that um, there, there have been some citizen petition articles that have requested funding, uh, one for the energy study that was a one-off one $100,000, and then uh, an ongoing the um, request for the sustainability director at $100,000 on an ongoing basis. Um, so I, I think that um, it's citizen, citizen petitions don't, articles don't concern, concern me. It is a, it's a relief valve, if you will, if some people feel that we haven't been responsive to their interests and needs. They can bring an article before town meeting. I know it must be frustrating to, for you to go through a complex uh, budgeting process and then have 
um, a citizen petition article request funding can go right to the head of the line so without being evaluated with all of the town's other priorities but it seems like it hasn't happened a lot so it's not a big concern for me I including sometimes the uh, bans on plastic water bottles or plastic bags there's some enforcement requirements some staffing requirement for that it's not much but sometimes there are financial impacts to those bylaws um, but I, I think it, it provides a citizen. It's great to have the citizens involved in, in government taking this stuff seriously. So I don't think it's a, a drawback. Um, Excuse me, the resiliency committee or whatever we voted last town meeting, did, did that put any pressure on any of the town? Which is it? It was called resiliency. Yeah, uh, resi yeah there is a um, resiliency um, group, and they are you know, looking at ways in which we can better uh, prepare for um, heavy storm heavy storms and that sort of okay. thing so that and the sustainability director is actively engaged in the resiliency question okay um, so that's not putting any incremental burden on town services as far as no we've been <coughs> already doing a lot of that sustainability okay. Um, okay. stuff with the existing staff okay. um so our question eight is land acquisition uh provide an overview of the steps being taken to build financial reserves for mm -hmm. land purchases <coughs> also post closure development and maintenance costs for projects such as 2229 Main Street, Moore's Pond, White Pond. Um, it is sometimes a challenge. Um, 2229 Main, Main Street is unique because we know it's there and we know uh, it seems like it's going to be offered to the town to acquire uh, that 45 acre parcel of the step former StarMet site or nuclear metal site. Um, and the, the EPA is interested in having the town acquire it because we will exercise what they call institutional controls. We'll make sure the environmental protections that, that have been safeguards that have been put in place at great expense by the EPA on the site will be protected by the town. We'll take seriously the obligation to maintain the encapsulated uh, contamination or, or, or other measures, whereas a private property owner, if the property was to change hands privately you know, multiple times, a future owner might not take those obligations quite so seriously. So they, I think that's the reason why they're interested in having the town um, take over the property. They've offered to provide some um, planning assistance and support with a consultant, a private consultant, to do, help us do land planning and how we would use a 45-acre site, which is pretty significant size, and what needs, municipal needs could be addressed. Um, and so that, that particular acquisition affords us the opportunity to think ahead and set money aside and, and plan what would the maintenance cost be. Um, things like the White Pond or Giro, uh, you're reacting in, in a short period of time to um, an opportunity. Um, and sometimes it's, tr it's more challenging to, to come up with a budget for maintenance when you're not even really sure if the town wants to acquire it. If they do, what do they want to do with it? We have some ideas on a park um, or a beach. But sometimes that what we think you know seems like a good idea doesn't come to fruition. So I, I will, in response, I will say it's a challenge sometimes. Um, although generally land acquisition, take the Balls Hill Road land acquisition, there really hasn't been a lot of costs associated with that. That was a tremendous partnership with the land trust. Um, uh, the, the NRC has put in a six-car parking lot. I think at relatively low cost. We don't spend a lot of money um, maintaining open land. So it, it, it to me it really isn't a big. Um, uh, obligation. A park is a different thing. So when we built the right, we acquired an extra acre of land at right out field, tore down the house, built um, some additional play space, um, and landscaped that part of the park differently. So it's not you can't mow it with a gang mower t 12 feet wide. You, 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 we planted some ornamental That's trees, great. so it's more attractive, I think, but it's a little more maintenance intensive. So and that would be true probably at Giro and probably White Pond as well. Um, so. Yeah. I don't know if that's responsive or not. That, so, uh, Chris, it's 2229. Um, <clears throat> we did spend, uh, or we have spent uh, some money for a study on that. Um, what's going on with that? The um, EPA, right now, it, it, it's in a, uh, it's going to a record of decision. I haven't heard that it, um, that it's been reported, but um, a plan has been devised for remediating the, the remaining contamination now that the buildings have been taken down. And, um, and the rec that record of decision is being, um, uh, public hearings being held, decisions being made. And so they, EPA offered um, some support for us to do the land planning. Um, and they uh, asked me to hold off on doing that until the decision is made and everything goes to record. And then sometime around the first of the year, we can restart that planning process.
Okay, so that's land acquisition. Sorry, just one question on that. Emerson land? Oh, Emerson land, that, that is something that you'll see. Um, the Emerson uh, folks approached us almost at the exact same time as the Balls Hill Road opportunity came along and we said, you know, we've got 80 acres. Um, you know, down along the river was, was more critical to us. So they were patient, the Emerson folks. What's happening at Emerson is they, the Emerson house, they own a, a couple of building lots on either side of the Emerson house with frontage on Cambridge Turnpike. Uh, they own the uh, acre or so of land next to the police station. It's a pump, they call it the pumpkin field, I think. It's planted in different things, but it's uh, near the ice house. There's an open land there. And then there's some wetland between the Emerson House and the police station. It's wet back there, but that's where the Thoreau Amble Trail is, and there's some uh, boardwalk bridges back there. So they've asked us to the town if we would consider acquiring uh, the interest, the conservation restriction, or, or the fee interest in those properties, um, for, and, and precluding them from development, um, and to the proceeds of, of that, those sales would go into an endowment to maintain the Emerson House on an ongoing basis. So they've broken it up into three parcels. That I, I believe it's the two building lots next to the existing Emerson House, uh, the farm field, and then the wetland areas. And they said, here's three different. Um, parcels with different prices totaling I think 1.2 million dollars and they originally said you know why don't you buy them one at a time each three successive years uh, recently I think they said you know we really we're ur urgently would like to um, move forward with this creation of this endowment and we're hoping that you buy the uh, the town would acquire the wetland area and the farm field first the farm field I think is the most valuable parcel <coughs> and, uh, and then you know at, at a later time the other so we're in active discussion. Uh, the Natural Resources Commission is close to the Fairyland Town Forest. It's, it's near, near the center of town. The Millbrook is back there. So there is considerable interest in, um, in acquiring the property. So it's also pretty <coughs> close to District Court? Yes. And District Court is slated to stop operation. Is that accurate? I've, I've heard that. Um, I think our um, uh, folks that are at the court regularly have heard rumors from some of the staff that work there that, that it may be consolidated and, uh, and um, the activities there may go elsewhere and the, and the court may be surplus by the state and the building may be available to us typically at market rate, not for free. But um, And I think we would be interested in that. I mentioned a municipal, a municipal office building that might be a good site for a municipal office building. Um, it, which would combine the people in this townhouse with the 141 Kai's Road and perhaps some other uh, operation as well. Including some of the police and fire needs. That and or the police and fire. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. Yeah. So, using very efficiently all space available to them in the building and then some, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So we're, uh, we, I, I have not heard, I think we've got, uh, contacted Corey Atkins' office and she hadn't heard anything about it maybe a year ago. Um, so I haven't heard any recent uh, discussion about it. We'll keep, we're keeping our eyes open. The conference have the court since yeah. only in times. Yeah. yeah, it's been quite a long time. I think this, the this district was, courts in every town would because you had to take a horse and buggy yeah. to the court. Of course. Um, this building was the courthouse for Right. Yeah. So, yeah, the Conwell had 300 some odd courthouses. Yeah. That's why we have so much traffic. <laughs> of all the roads. <laughs> Isn't the fact that a lot of our building, public buildings are spread out is because they're done opportunistically? Yeah, I think, yes. As opposed yep. to looking at a plan and saying, do we really need the court? Is the courthouse the right place? Right, yeah, fair enough. That, that's what this comprehensive is plan is. Why supposed hired to consultant. Right. And I you know, plead guilty to, we've been opportunistic when the 55 Church Street came available exactly. and we had a need for human so services, so we yeah. took advantage of that. We have done that on a number of occasions and we really should think of um, you know, so th those communities that have a single municipal office building, ideally with a school superintendent nearby as well. Andover has that, other communities do. It's really helpful to have all the town staff working in close proximity just to, to communicate more frequently. Um, okay. Maybe one last question. Has the town ever done an analysis of, of perhaps selling some surplus land that's not, you know, nice beachfront or conservation land or just surplus to requirements that could be sold for maybe another purpose, maybe affordable housing?
housing or something else? We did, uh, I'm, during my tenure here, I, I can think of one instance of where that happened that was um, on Strawberry Hill Road, the Finnegan's Way, yes. that was owned by the town, acquired for school purposes. I think generally there was agreement there was never going to be a school building built that close to Barrett's farmhouse, which is with historic implications and that sort of thing. So, and we were interested in acquiring the Benson land next to the Ripley School Building. So we sold uh, the, um, the Strawberry Hill Road land uh, that became Finnegan's Way and used the proceeds of that sale to purchase the Benson land to create a bigger campus next to Ripley so that if, if there ever was a need for a new school on that site, it's a significant size campus and that, that could easily host a, a school uh, as well as school administration. So we did in that case sell, but that's the only instance I can think of where we uh, uh, did that. We haven't looked at it comprehensively to list all of our properties and see which ones do you think that would be a worthwhile endeavor? Um, I don't know. I think that um, each neighborhood gets very attached to the open space or the public lands near them. So I think um, on, on paper it might look like a good idea to sell off 10 acres that we have. Uh, I can think of a few parcels, uh, but I think that you know, neighbors nearby really cherish the open space and you know, would be concerned if it was to be developed for housing. So, um, good question. Um, so I think, I think with succession planning, I, 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 you, you probably know the story. Just I, I did announce my plans to retire, providing t a 12 months advance notice. Um, the select board has uh, requested green cards for people interested in serving. They have a list of names. I think uh, at the, uh, they're going to be talking about it next Monday. What the process is going to be for selecting a committee. Um, I think the two two members of the select board that will sit on that committee, Alice Kaufman and Mike Lawson will, um, I think, probably select a, cons a search consultant um, and, I you I and identify for the search committee, this is the consultant we'd like you to use. And uh, there will be a search consultant. It's very helpful, I think, for, to proactively seek experienced managers uh, um, from other communities um, and do the recruitment process. They will, I think their plan is to have some kind of a public process to solicit community input on the type of uh, uh, person that you're looking for and, and uh, skills, that sort of thing. Um, I imagine just after the first of the year, the notice will go in the paper uh, in other locations to, to start the recruitment process. And the goal, I think, is to have somebody in place um, around May 1st. My suggestion would be to have it around May 1st. Uh, I would, I'm planning to leave sort of mid-May and be on vacation the, the last uh, uh, into June. But you know, I won't be around. Right. I'll be here, here for town meeting in April and about a month after that, and then, um, and then be on vacation after that. And, uh, and I did mention in my comments here is that if for some reason they've made an offer to somebody who really feels they need to give a month or an extensive um, notice to their current employer, doesn't want to leave somebody in the lurch, um, the assistant town manager is fully capable of, of carrying any transition between my, my departure and the, new, the arrival of the new person. We've got somebody who's here and during my vacations and absences has been able to handle it. And we have a very capable, strong department here. So the senior management staff is very capable. Oh, hope that that's responsive. Um, there's also a question there about um, zero-based budgeting, which was a little confusing I um, in terms of the heading. But um, the, the, I mentioned there that we're going to carefully watch how the school how the school administration responds to zero-based budgeting. Uh, I think the thought behind that, John, you can help me out here, was to um, it was a suggestion that zero-based budgeting be part of the interview with the interview process, or when we're uh, considering candidates, if we were to ask them if they were familiar with zero-based budgeting, if they thought it was something that could be useful here in Concord. Was that your correct? Thinking? Exactly. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. The origin was: to, Were we aware of any other towns that employed it? And it was a difficult answer to get. So that was the genesis. Yeah. So one thing I might say is that the recruitment consultants are, will be very all the there's five different firms that I'm we're aware. Of. Um, they're all managed by uh, 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 experienced town managers, um, so uh, and they and they've interviewed all kinds of management professionals. So that'd be a great question to, to feed through to the search committee to ask: um, Can they point you to some communities that are using that approach to budgeting? And get opinions from potential candidates. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
benchmarking is question 10. Um, we, had, we subscribed to ClearGov. Um, I used it on the comparing the legal services that I put on the slide at town meeting uh, last week. Um, so it is helpful to have that software that uh, ena enables us to access uh, what other communities are spending on police services, legal services, what have you. Um, some town departments have included comparative information in their budget last year. So I think the police department did, and several others compared staffing levels to other <coughs> communities, and budget levels to other communities. So we're going to encourage that to happen on a regular basis. Um, uh, on public-private partnerships, um, a comment on that. I think the most significant, more active one that we have going on right now is the library, uh, where the, li the buildings and the special collections are owned by the uh, Concord Free Public Library Corporation. Uh, and the town of Concord provides, they have an annual operating budget of I think about $400,000 to uh, ensure and maintain the two library buildings. Uh, the town of Concord provides about a $2.1 million operating budget for staffing and supplies and utilities. Um, and so that's a, a great partnership. The library corporation is undertaking a major a fund capital campaign to fund an extension onto the existing main library and to subsume the property at, at 51 Main Street. Um, and uh, so we have to work carefully to you know, be sure we're uh, both on the same page and, and we've tried to set funds aside for staffing and cleaning and utility costs associated with the expanded building. Um, uh, and we've, and you, you saw an article uh, on the town we warrant last year to fund some uh, energy efficient lighting and uh, energy efficient products for that project. And this year you'll see a request for $500,000 for furniture, fixtures, and equipment um, that would go into the new building. The corporation's paying the cost um, of the facility and we are continue our role of, of providing the, the furnishings, the equipment, and that sort of thing. Um, another, um, so, and I think that uh, has, you know, really provide us with a library that exceeds you know, community, typical communities of our size to have. We have more hours than many towns, two or three times larger than us. The fact that we have branch li li libraries open as many hours as we're open, it's, it's quite unusual. And I think the library experience, that you, the services that are provided um, have just been um, augmented. Circulation is somewhat down. Um, circ traditional circulation of books is somewhat down, but people are going there for all kinds of other, other things. Um, uh, other P3s, of the Emerson Umbrella, um, 51 Walden, or the Full Pack, uh, Friends of the Performing Arts. Um, uh, the other P3s that enhance the community include the Restorative Justice, Friends of C.C. Fields, um, the Concord Housing Development Corporation, the Domestic Violence Prevention Program, Garden Club maintains the flowers out front here um, and, and elsewhere. Um, the Land Trust has been a great partner. I think so. I, I think Concord has benefited tremendously from the public-private partnerships that we <coughs> used. Uh, there was a, a public-private partnership study committee. They recommended that we try to exercise more. First of all, one of the frustrations I think people had was that some of those the, the decisions that are made by the private parties are not public, and sometimes the public can't get access to that decision-making process. So I think the hope was that the town would get more involved and host uh, if we had a committee that was managing a, um, a, a, a partnership like the library, this library project, and the community that had questions about it could go to a public entity and have their questions answered or that sort of thing. So um, we're giving some consideration to that. We wouldn't do that for the garden club or one of the smaller projects, but I think the committee even said some of the project's over $100,000. Maybe you want to create opportunities for the public to find out more about what's happening. Yeah, and, and the, the Housing Development Corporate Junction Village was a case. Exactly. The Anderson Umbrella people, neighbors had questions about what was happening there. So um, I think it was a good recommendation that we're exploring you know, how, how, to, how to implement the community's regulations. Uh, and then additional information, the, um, the, the last, um, I did want to comment on the citizen survey. We uh, provided some, or John provided some comments on, on how people feel about the money that they're spending. Um, and then lastly is the, the inventory of um, department head requests for funds before they've submitted their budgets. Um, the finance department is just now collecting formal budget requests from department heads so they get the details. But uh, the preliminary, this is the preliminary list of, um, of expenditures that department heads are hoping the town might uh, make available. And, and there's considerable additional staff uh, that have been requested, in, including 
uh, a, a position the town manager's office shared with the human resources department. We don't have a receptionist in this, in this building, and, and often we have um, people up on at lunchtime, the public comes in and uh, has difficulty finding out, uh, getting directions from where they need to go. The resource sustainability position that was funded by town meeting citizen petition, um, we didn't fully fund it to expend all the funds the first year, so we, last year we came up, had to come up with $48,000. This year we have to fully fund it, so uh, the that increases our obligation to $52,000. Um, and uh, we're interested in hiring a facilities HVAC technician. This will actually result currently spending about $160,000 on HVAC um, in, 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 in 15 different HVAC budgets and 15 different building accounts, totaling $160,000. We think we can um, uh, cover that cost and actually save money by hiring a person to do this work for us rather than contracting with the firm. Um, and, uh, let's see, White Pond um, supplemental operating costs, I'm suggesting um, that they go down for the second year. Legal services, we may want to consider, I don't know if it's critical, we increased it by $25,000 for the current year. Suggest we might want to consider increasing again, but that might not be necessary. We have that one case that really, um, and the collective bargaining that really added to our cost. The collective bargaining is mostly uh, resolved. If we can resolve the other litigation matter, we don't really need a permanent increase in the legal services budget. So we'll have more conversation about that next month. Um, planning department would like to en enhance some local transportation. The natural resources would like a permanent uh, land manager. We have summer help. We've had many years. We've had summer, two summer positions, uh, low cost college uh, age folks that come in and maintain the uh, conservation lands. Um, but it doesn't. Not much gets done in the off season. And the natural resources commission would really like to have somebody year round to address fallen trees and, and other maintenance activity of the 1,200 acres of conservation land that they, they manage. Um, what does enhancing local transportation? That's the, um, the uh, Crosstown Connect, for example, is a, we're, we're part of a consortium, we joined a consortium last year of Stowe and Hudson and Acton. Uh, they're very actively managing tra uh, their transit, uh, uh, trying to get cars off the road, trying to get seniors rides that maybe don't have a ride, or all, but also getting cars off the road by uh, maybe bringing commuters to the train station uh, or from the train station uh, to the employers. Um, that sort of thing. So other communities, Bedford and Burlington, they're very active in trying to manage um, these uh, last mile uh, um, transportation issues. And we, we're a little bit behind the curve on that. You agree? Yeah, yeah. I, do. I do. I agree. My husband um, can't drive, and for him to find transportation around Concord is very difficult. The council on aging is limited. That's all I'll say. Yeah, You've heard that a lot. Uh, town archivist. Um, let's see, the, the uh, we we have a part-time town archivist. The position is really it hasn't focused on the town archives, and it's time we have a decentralized paper management. So the police chief is responsible for maintaining the records of the police department. And, Public Works, Public Works Department, and the best business, best practice recommended by the Secretary of State's office built is the Burlington model, where they have a full-time town archivist. Those departments just drop their boxes of records. Department heads typically don't know when you can get rid of payroll records, when you can get rid of routine correspondence, and when you can get rid of budgeting and other grant information. And town archivist knows exactly how long the retention schedule is. We work with, it, we report to the town clerk, we work with the town clerk in managing the public records. Um, you know, we're at risk of losing important public records because they might get disposed of by somebody who doesn't know what the law is, what the rules are, and we really need to have a professional town archivist. So, uh, we like, like we should beef up that uh, that position um, uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and I just mentioned our, our town clerk it was a town clerk in Westford where they went through a terrible experience where they lost a lot of their they had floods in the town hall and they lost a lot of their ancient records of old records. It was very costly to try to you know preserve them after after fact. Um, the police uh, indicated there is the general fund support for the school resource officer, which was combined with that grant from the community chest and the Muse stabilization fund. Uh, and then also two additional police officers, a detective to deal with the opioid problem and a, and a daytime officer to deal with, help deal with the additional calls. Fire staffing I've mentioned, as well as the um, uh, fire lieutenants. 
We do. We keep we keep records on that. I don't have it right now. I can. That will be part of the presentation. So, f fair question. And what the nature of it is, a lot of it has to do with medical. We, you know, Concord is a destination for not just Emerson Hospital, but there's a lot of medical offices, and it's often the police are the closest, and therefore the first responders to get to different incidents that are happening. We have it's related to the fire departments. Um, uh, service population, the uh, service population, people that are in Concord during the day for different for medical appointments and everything else, commuters getting using the train and so forth, is dramatically more than, than the nighttime population of 17,000 people. It's, it's about 30, it's over 30,000 people are here working or attending you know appointments and that sort of thing, and they have they have medical emergencies, other types of emergencies, and so the call volume for both police and fire department has increased. So Chris. On this 115,000 for the two additional officers, is that the fully loaded rate that's included? It's just the salaries. Just salaries. So I think the intention would be to have the police budget absorb the cost of the uniforms, the training, and, and that sort of thing. And benefits are included in the retire uh, in, in the in the benefits um, account. So Kerry uh, would have to make an adjustment for she have to, you know tally up how many new positions ultimately get funded and adjust the health insurance budget. Retirement um, budget uh, accordingly. So, so when you propose a position, those adjustments are being made in those other accounts while the pro proposed position is yes, under discussion. Correct. So it's not as though that doesn't get factored in someplace. It does. It does. It does. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not shown here. No, but uh, it's great but to know that we, if we, we handle it and it's, yeah, we're rolling it up all the way through the system. Is that a number that's easily explored, Leslie, that um, it would be interesting to me and doubtless to others to know what would be the total cost of two new officers, including you know, the fully loaded cost? But that's a fair question. I'm, I'm sure we can provide that for you. Yeah. Again, some of it, will. We, the police chief has said, I'll absorb cost of uniforms, equipment, training, weapon, those within the budget, um, the salary, you know, is what I need. you can't do. But I'll get that, that information for you. I think it's true for all the positions. It, 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 it would differ, you know, the right, cost of a police right. officer is different from the cost of a library. Right. The library but understanding or that like, an archivist is 65000 in salary, but then what would be the town's contribution for health care, OPEB, and retirement? Okay. Um, so that once we understand, and, and it's a more robust way for everyone to understand what the ask mm -hmm. is. Right. So for this preliminary conversation, we don't usually do that. When you give me the preliminary guideline and say, this is how much you have, that's when we get into the weeds on what, the, what positions are we really going to try to fund and what's the cost of those positions, rather than run those complex numbers on you know, Understood. But in the past, when we've talked even further down the road, yep. we tend to only talk about the salary number. Fair, fair enough. Good point. Um, so last year, our former colleague Trevaney asked a question with respect to police officers that I thought was, was, was a good one. And the question was, could a regular salaried scheduled police officer actually, an additional police officer, make a material impact on, on the overtime budget? It has, uh, it has some favorable impact uh, on the overtime budget. So I would expect if we hired particularly the, the detective, for example, not necessarily, um, but the daytime officer, yes, by, by staffing. That, that's part of what the, the police chief is trying to acquire, is he's trying to, uh, trying to achieve, is to have, um, he often doesn't replace the first officer that's out on vacation or out sick, but when, two, when the shift is down two officers, he does replace that person at overtime. By having a larger shift to start out with, he might not have to replace either the first First officer out or the second officer. I just wonder so if, if he might be interested in doing that analysis to, to partially also to justify the adjustment. There may be some overtime. Exactly. Yeah. That's a good point. Do you want to just It's a good question. Uh, so that's uh, police fire, IT communications for the library. Can we back uh, up to the fire for a minute? Sure. So these two positions here. No, one is a position, a second staff, and the next is promoting 
um, current firefighters. Right. So That's first is four, on four, five, four, five. So this firefighters. doesn't include the four incrementals that you're hiring and funding out of the stabilization. This is this is the general fund so first year general fund support for the four officers. So the um, the total uh, cost of the four officers is two twenty five um, along that line and. And um, the fire chief's proposal is that we provide um, $89,000 this year, an additional $89,000 in the second year, and reduce the, the stabilization fund support by that amount, and then another $89,000 in the third year. And, the, and then the stabilization fund goes away, and the general fund has fully funded the positions over three years. That's the fire chief's proposal. So this $89,000 increase is a portion of the cost of the four firefighters. Uh, Does that make sense? Yes. There, the part of the class, yeah. well, what would happen if you just hired two additional firefighters? Would that mean you could expand the hours? They operate, the fire department operates on, with four groups. Um, so what he's doing is adding one firefighter to each group. Um, and so that um, we've added one firefighter to each group, that's, and those officers are working, most of the firefighters are working 24 on, 24 off, they work a 24 hour shift. These folks are working a 12 hour shift, which is a little unusual and um, not necessarily desirable to be the only folks in the group that are working a 12 hour shift. So when uh, we add another firefighter to each of those groups, they would, um, they would work, then work the 24, uh, 24 hours. And I'm sorry, I think I'm forgetting your, your question. Uh, oh, could we just add two? So that wouldn't, so we add two groups with enough firefighters and two groups that are short of firefighters. So we find that the ambulance would be operating, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday or something, or something like that. Or, you know, whenever these different groups are working, it, it, no, it wouldn't really, wouldn't achieve our goal. So is this all predicated on getting the second ambulance in West Concord? Fully staffed. Yes. We have it, we have the ambulance and we have it partially we have it staffed. We have the ambulance. So it's just sitting there. Correct. And the evening hours, hours, hours is at eight, um, eight. I think it's six to six or it's, uh, eight to eight. Eight to eight. Okay. Eight p.m. to eight a.m. So in order to get so. that uh, staffed, so the additional twelve hours every day, it would cost us four additional firefighters. Correct. And and promotions to. For and current it, it's not required. No. Um, okay. it, they're two distinct yeah. requests, but with then eight additional um, firefighters in total in the last five years, that's a lot of, for the captain who's operating out of the, um, the main headquarters. Mm -hmm. That's a lot to ask him to manage those two those two buildings while, while multiple incidents are going on. So what will what would happen? So right now we have a captain at the headquarters with five uh, employees that report to him and a lieutenant in West Concord with four. And uh, the goal would be to have a, a second lieutenant in the headquarters station so the captain could go wherever he's needed. And not, because he, he's serving as both the shift commander, managing the whole operation in the town, and the, uh, the, the leader of his group in the, in the, in the headquarters yes. station. So what he's asking is that we have a second person to be the leader of the group, and he, managed the whole, he manages the whole shift, the captains. So Chris, the, the the total eventual cost of staffing the second ambulance is, if I understand correctly, $267,000 a year. But we're going to sort of step into it. What happens during the steps? What are, I mean, are we not going to have? So we, we're, so we, we're, we'll be fully funded. We'll be using, utilizing, to get to the 260, we'll be using Muse money um, uh, to combine okay, with this okay, 89,000 okay. total amount that's needed, right. and then diminishing the Muse contribution and increasing the general fund support gotcha. on a. Uh, so that by year three, it's all. Year, in year three, uh, in year four, year four. it's uh, uh, um, no, there's no more Muse. Fund. And the 267 that Tom just um, calculated for us again is just so it's not any burden. That's correct. Is that, is that yes, correct? Yes, that's yes. correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, IT um, in the position in the library. Uh, I'm interested in um, the, I, the, the library is on the cutting edge for um, you know change developments in, in technology. Um, yeah, that's where people are most most are most knowledgeable about uh, IT matters um, are are going. 
And we found that it's, it's hard to keep a librarian up to speed with all the changes that are going on and the d different devices people use. So my suggestion is that we hire a, a person that will report to the CIO, the Chief Information Officer, and who will be current and stay current in all technology matters uh, that will work with the librarians, but that will not be a librarian um, him or herself. Um, so this is for a, a tech position in the library that's not a librarian. Most of our um, tech positions in the library right, right now are librarians who have a, a knack for technology, but aren't really technology uh, people. So anyway, this is the change. And because the expanded um, li main library is going to have a technology focus where they're going to really try to um, beef up the technology, technology that's out there. Um, the part time the custodian, uh, the, the, there's a need for right now. The, the library director is sort of the chief custodian or chief maintenance person. So, anything related to the contracts of custodial cleaning, repairs, all that goes through the library director. She, she spends a lot of time managing the facility, um, and it'd be helpful for, to her to have a maintenance supervisor 20 hours a week to manage those contracts. Um, Council on Aging is hoping for some additional um, support staff for drivers and, and, activi and activity coordinators, what that should say, um, and then some additional expenses related to the three uh, council on aging grants that we have, and they're not only for council on aging use anymore, they can be used for multiple things. Um, two recreation park staff, that the, that's the white, we need to maintain white pond, the Jarrow land, the right, new ride out field, and uh, some of our other parks, we have some orphan, uh, parts of our parks where the, the Public Works Department has the gang mowers that do all the fields and do it very efficiently, but a lot of the other areas around the park are not really maintained, um, and we need somebody to sort of care for the whole park. And so we're gonna combine Public Works support with the uh, Parks uh, Recreation Department support, ideally. Um, capital outlay plan increase as the budget goes up, our allocation for capital outlay needs to go up, and we have the plan, you have the plan attached to where we would spend that money. And last but not least is the salary reserve adjustment. This is at 3%. I should note that there. Uh, we have a lower number for 25 but uh, if we were to consider a 3% salary adjustment um, for next July 1st, it costs us a million dollars. And uh, grand total of the, the items requested there is 1.98 million. Uh, that's an 8.27% increase above the current level of funding. So I know that's a, a preliminary. Great names in this list. <laughs> what's, our, what's our current median tax bill? Fourteen thousand It's interesting that more than fifty percent of this increase is just for the salaries. And how much can what can we do about that? Yeah. Um, so would you expand upon what you just said about the about salary reserve funding of 2%? What? So in order to fund a 3% salary adjustment for the non-union employees, plus contract settlements in that neighborhood going forward, um, John estimates the uh, cost would be the, the number you see there. If it was two, I asked him also to run the number for 2.5%. Do you have that? He's got it for million five. This number is one million twenty-seven. Yeah, so it'd be one million five five thousand. One million five thousand is only twenty-two thousand dollars yeah, difference yeah, for half a percent. Yeah, that's, um, not, that's not much. And, and is the three percent? Where does that come from? What? So the um, it's relative to what other communities are paying. Um, many communities are paying in the two to three. Three's on the high, high side, but Burlington, for example, I think granted uh, union contracts in the three percent range. There's a few other communities, not many. Um, most are in the two, around two and a half, some at two. Um, so three is on the high side of what other towns are providing for cost of living adjustment. Um, but I mentioned it as something where we're in a competitive, we're in a competitive environment. We are, we are having difficulty hiring some key positions. Um, and uh, we have that issue with the lower health insurance. I'm not proposing that we change our health insurance contribution, but we might want to consider increasing the salaries um, to, 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 to Take some of the steam out of that. And, and does that three percent for fiscal twenty in any way affect expectations about subsequent? 
the physical years. No, I think uh, employees realize that it's a uh, you know employees that don't have a contract realize it's a year to year situation. Employees that do have a contract, you know, it's sometimes it plays in their favor and they're getting more, uh, and sometimes not so much. That the, uh, contra the contracts are behind, and, and so it, it you know, goes both ways. But it doesn't create any expectations. It's I think whatever the community can afford, whatever we think is reasonable. When you say that we have trouble filling some positions, like especially with the light plant, and that's why you want three percent, um, can't you just raise what you're offering for that position without raising everybody three percent? Or mm -hmm. uh, that's a cha that's a challenge. I will say at the light plant we have you've noticed that in our in the articles that deal with the pay and classification and the warrant, you know, yeah. it used to just be. Uh, laboring class employees and professional, and there was only two categories. We've now tried to split it up so that we tried to put the light plant employees particularly together. So we could, we can, if we're, that's the area where we are having some trouble. Right. There's an opportunity to, to adjust the compensation for those positions. Yeah. Um, so that's possible. But if we, um, there are uh, uh, classifications that cover you know, many departments, including the light plant. So the accounting position, I think, is grouped with all the other financial people. So we can't just increase the compensation for the, the light plant account <coughs> and not, you know, okay. provide comparable adjustments for other people that are involved. Okay, but you have some flexibility. Yeah, we have some flexibility. Okay. Just so. as comparison, um, so the, the uh, last high school teacher contract um, that uh, went out to negotiate years ago, um, and I believe it was two, seven five. No, I think it was two, two, and two and a half, wasn't it? Three-year contract. Two, two and a half. I don't know. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, saw the number just the other day too. Yeah, it was less than three percent. It is less than three years. There's a two and three quarter in there somewhere, but I don't know if it's CPS or the region. So, so with respect to using Burlington as a comp, I mean Burlington is a different, yeah, has a different tax base than you know, all these uh, large commercial industrial commercial. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they shift they shift the tax rate, you know, so it doesn't hit the residential rate as high. Perhaps. Do they have different different rate for commercial? They do. Yeah, uh, Lexington, Bedford, Burlington, those communities along 128. They all shift uh, to the commercial industrial sector and really raise a lot of revenue that way and have a lot more flexibility. Um, whereas our uh, rate really hits the residential taxpayer, you know, fully on. Any, any um, people in the audience have any questions? Yeah, I'll just ask about this, uh, this email. Maybe you did before I did. 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 Okay. Do you want to ask a question? Um, did you ask about the bus facilities? Um, it's on the list, and, and it's indicated. My understanding is that the um, both the CP, CPS and the region pay fully pay for all the operating costs of so, you know, heating the building and the lighting and uh, staffing um, that are paid for by Conk and Carlisle and High School. So both communities participate, um, but the capital cost there's been no recovery in the capital cost. So, 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 I, I remember a promise. When this was being built, that the uh, town would charge rent or the schools would pay rent, or the district would pay rent. Do we call that uh, representation? It was discussed. It was it was, it was absolutely discussed, and, um, and I think the statement from Carlisle was that we they, and they, I mentioned earlier in an earlier conversation that when they were rent leasing space and acting. Um, the region contributed to the lease cost, and therefore the, the, the fair share was paid. When the <coughs> building, the lease went away, and therefore the payment went away. Um, I did discuss with the superintendent when the building opened. You know, could we work out an arrangement on lease? How how can we how can we do this to to have it fair? And after a couple of conversations, said there's no real easy way to, to make that happen. That's, that's a challenge. Well, when we paid, the town contract paid for the building. Correct. Four million dollars, plus, approximately, and town Conquer paid for the old bus depot too. Yes, correct. And um, when that was torn down, that was still the title and not been turned over to the school district. Is that is that correct? Uh, not in any formal way. I think there was the the understanding was that it was property of the region that when it was 
built on, on their property. Is there an agreement with the town board? No. no. Okay. So the school district tore down a million dollar property the town built. Carlisle didn't contribute to that. And now we built another four million dollar building. Carlisle has not contributed to that. Correct. So can't we charge rent to this district? So I'm, I'm open to, I did broach the subject with the superintendent um, and, and it was a challenge. So the two of us had that conversation and I understand her position and she understands mine. And, um, but I think it's a bigger, con it's a bigger conversation. Yeah. How and the same for all these others. Yeah. Uh, what about all these others where Carlisle is not, hasn't contributed to the Brooklyn building, uh, Emerson Track, BD, etc. So, so far, we, we just, I just provided the information. It might be the committee no. wants to talk about it no. and figure out the okay. okay. so so not, so. nobody's, nobody's asked. No. Okay. Also, didn't we decide that we would try to determine what was common and what was best practice? Correct. Some that's some fair. That's right. My, I, suggestion, my question was the auditor, but maybe that's not the right way to approach it. But by some measure, we should look at these issues and, and see what's I've been asked to do that. So one way or another, however, we'll either internally we'll do it or out using somebody outside. We'll some sense. find out from a handful that. of um, yeah. districts in our area, is it typical for the host community to assume all of these costs or, or not? You know, and, and exactly, we'll doc, document how, how it works. Thank you for my Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 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 You're still on. <laughs> I don't know who's sitting up there, but you're still on. All right, so as soon as my computer comes up, I'm going to show you what we have for fiscal 20. Revenues and fixed costs. You don't have a copy of that, do you? I don't. Um, okay. okay, that's okay. I can I can distribute something no, to okay. you. So in, in terms of revenue, obviously it's very early to be making estimates on revenues. Uh, we don't really have any idea yet what the state will be doing for fiscal 20. They're still working on closing out 18 um, and, and seeing what's coming in for 19. Our local receipts, we're just looking at our historical trends at this point and trying to give more weight to what happened in, in the recent year. Uh, in the recent past year, we talked about the increase in hotel motel tax and meals tax at the last meeting, so we're trying to factor that in. Um, the way that I project property tax is we ended, or once we certify our tax rate, uh, when we factor in new growth, we will have an unused levy capacity down here <coughs> of 4.03 million or 5.4 a 4.54% of the levy. So what I assume going into fiscal 20 is that you want to maintain that 4.54%. So you assume what? I assume as a starting point that you want to maintain the same unused levy capacity going into fiscal 20 that you have in fiscal 19. Just as a starting point. Or she's, I think she's saying we want to keep a stable uh, uh, level of expenditure. Is that the same thing? But she's 
stable percentage coming from, from property taxes. Well, it's another way of saying that we, we would find acceptable a growth of our annual budget by 4.5%. No. 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 Okay. no. So I'm totally misunderstood. It, it's the, power, the amount that we're that's available. under two and a half. That we we could tax okay. and okay. we're not. All right. So it's what's we're going to do less without an override. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is that right? You have to yeah. assume something. Right. Yep. So and assuming saying. that the unused money capacity stays the same as last year is the starting assumption. It's the starting exactly. assumption. Okay. It can, it can be you. something else, but this is where. We started last year. If you'd like to start somewhere else, we, that can easily be factored in. So if we make that assumption, then and we factor in an estimate for, for new growth, and we factor in what the exempt debt will be, the increase in property taxes, if you're comparing um, total tax raised in 20 versus 19 is 3.89%. Now that includes new growth and it includes an increase in exempt debt. That is not the starting point for the proposed impact to the existing base. And we'll, we can go through the difference there. Um, in Say that again. Say that last sentence again. The two. No, so what was the last sentence? I already forgot. What did you say? It's really good. She, she's trying to differentiate between um, the oh, yes. impact on existing taxpayers yeah. and the total increase yeah. from tax revenue. Which, uh, the so you're going at it from the revenue side. Right yes. now, we're just looking at it. Okay. Right okay. We're totally separate topics. And we'll, we'll, we'll morph, we'll morph totally into separate. what the impact okay. would be but for the existing for the next, That's what I want to know. Well, okay. but, 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 but there was another thing. You said the increase in exempt the, debt. The increase in exempt debt. And I was going to follow up with a point on that. So it's not, it's, it's not that the overall exempt debt is increasing. The change that is happening in fiscal 20 is there is no more money in the high school debt stabilization fund. So we have been pulling over the years an amount out of that fund. Right here, it's highlighted. So in fiscal 16, we took a million and a half out of that fund to reduce the exempt debt associated with the high school. In 17, it was a million. In 18, 785. And then last year, or the, this current year, we pulled out the last $275,000. So that's, that's the reason why the exempt debt to, to be raised is increasing, even though the overall debt is decreasing. John, what do you want me to go back to? Well, I was backing out the uh, impact of uh, <coughs> growth. You want, okay, let's, let's, just, let's just go here. And it must be less than that now. So let, let's just take, take a look at this in terms of property taxes. Sure. can you make it bigger for the cost to be able to see soon? Just a little. Um, you go up to the top. Yeah, view is up on the top. You can put it in the percentage. Oh, yeah. Like, click it. Digital swing is the bottom right. Look at that. That's the digital swing. Actually, if you click the 100, you get it. Actually, put a number in. Yeah, okay. Right here, right? Yep. Sorry. Thank you. How's that? Good? Okay. So if, if we want to just look at what is the impact to the existing base, that would be for um, not taking into, well, to the existing base, including the increase in the debt exclusion, it's 2.89%. Broken out between 2.44% to increase the base and 0.45% for the debt exclusion. So 2.89%. The new growth is 1.3%. The total is 4.8. And the, diff the difference is 
just what we're calling the base from, from one calculation to the other. But this is the calculation that we use in, the, in your spreadsheet, the guideline spreadsheet. We calculate base to base, not total tax to total tax like I'm using in the summary sheet. And the combination of those two is really about the 3.11? The three the three point one one is the overall revenue increase. Are we I, I won't move from this until people are and I'll i I'll I'm happy to send all of this out. Please send this out because something is, is not quite as I understood it. Um, we shouldn't really be comparing the three point one one, but we should be comparing the three point eight nine to the number before new growth. Right, and so the 3.89% the up here is comparing total tax to be raised yep. over total tax to be raised in the prior year. And the other shows base, the base tax, no, no exempt debt, no new growth over the base. And, I, and that percent we, increase is 2.8%. Two, 2.89. 2.89. So I'm maintaining this because the, these are the calculations that have been used in the past. I found it fairly confusing and spent a lot of time going through this, and I can show you the calculations. I think we can stick with the, the difficult thing is we like to break out what is the impact to the existing base. Uh, but for this presentation, we're comparing total tax to total tax. Um, we don't need to include that because we really focus in on what, what is the impact to the base. Um, so if this is confusing, we can eliminate it. <laughs> we don't ever, I only use this for my own purposes, we don't ever use this, I'm not sure this ever gets in the finance committee report or anything like that. You mean the total tax to total tax? Total tax to total tax. Oh, we, total our, we only look at the effect on the existing base? That when you go through, when you look at the guidelines worksheet, when you work through that process, you're looking at the impact to the existing base. When we do that, we are, you're right. Yeah. But isn't, so we usually have we have the income tax and then the, the tax. I'm happy to put together a narrative and spread send that out to you on how it's calculated, and you can let me know. Um, you can let me know your thoughts. I spent a lot of time going through it because it was confusing to me, because it seemed like they should both come out the same, but it has to do with the base that we're using, and I'm just maintaining the calculations that we've used over time. Um, and we certainly can change what we're focusing in on. Can, can I try to summarize what I think I, I think what you're showing us here is that if we want to keep the headroom in the levy limit, right. that was just an assumption. Yeah. And we make other assumptions about changes in state aid and changes in local, what can we increase um, our base at. What is the increase to the base? Is that the, is that what it comes around to? Or I mean, yes, you would be you would be increasing the base two point four four percent. Don't we need to make an assumption about changes in local receipts and state aid in order to figure out what the change would and be to the base? Yes, and that's all. So that's all factored in. So yeah, when, I, I don't we, that it's all right, So don't, don't we have to look at it this way? And we can't just look at the base. Well, you can't. You can't just look at the increase to property tax. That's what I meant. Right, because right. there is a huge decrease to available funds because we don't have anything coming from the high school debt stabilization fund. So, is that? I'm, I feel like I'm losing people. I feel like your idea to put a summary together and send it out 
and have us look at it. I would love to play around. Yeah. I would love to work to absorb. This is where this is a lot to absorb in 905. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. Yeah. Send, send that out. Send that out. But I would like to see it. And, and we, I would like to look around at it and then talk about it again. Yeah, and I, 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 I think what I was <laughs> hoping to do was to give you an idea of of what the numbers look like, what the fixed costs look like, so you can, you know, over the, the next six weeks or so, you're going to, you're going to hear from the school, you're going to have to make a decision on a preliminary guideline number, then you're going to get some more information. Um, I'm going to continue to work on these numbers. Ho hopefully we'll make some positive progress. Um, as time goes on, and then you make a final, a, a final, a preliminary final <laughs> recommendation in November, and then you look at it again before town. So, Carrie, on for, for the bigger picture, is, is this essentially telling us that the the total town budget could go up if it went up three point one one percent, then that would keep the levy override. Now yes. Million yeah. And if we if we flip here to this spreadsheet with which you're all familiar with, this 2.44 percent to the base would amount to a 2.67 percent increase to guidelines because we're taking into account additional revenue that is available. Right. So the town budget could go by 3.11, but the property tax increase would go up by 3.89 on her prior. The, the overall budget can go up 3.11, but that takes into account That's being solved the combined revenue from exactly. other sources. Exactly. But it, it is also the, the non-guidelines budget, the fixed cost, has to be taken into account. So the overall budget goes up 3.11 percent. Yep. But the guidelines portion can only go up 2.67 percent, without increasing, uh, without eating into oh, your unused levy capacity. Oh, because that were embedded in that 3.89 number. Yes. Okay. So I would like to just—I know it's late—spend a couple of minutes just looking at the fixed costs. Uh, I'll make this bigger. So this highlighted section, the, these are all the non-guidelines accounts, the fixed cost, which based on our current estimates will be $24.685 million in <coughs> fiscal 20. So these include health insurance, um, and I would like to point out these are known positions. We have not yet factored in any new positions because we're too it's it's too new until i know that the um, the town manager is looking to you know i don't i don't even want to say that because that that is sort of a, a negotiated process right i can't automatically assume that town meeting is going to approve <coughs> new positions and and put this in increase this number to account for that and then it takes away so from, from what is available. So that is a, it's a tricky process, um, but we certainly would be taking into account any positions he's going to fund uh, within his guideline increase, we would have the fixed cost portion of that accounted for. And so what was the percentage increase in fixed costs? Is that the, <coughs> the so the, the fixed cost, the, the, the range in increase is shown here, right here. This is the increase year over year. For each of those lines. For each yeah. of those lines. But the bottom line. So the delta the line is 24. Yeah. 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 And so and that's 
That's why we could only increase the operating budget by two point. By two two point seven six. Seven, seven, six, seven, six, I think it was. So health insurance. Um, our plan year is June one to May thirty first. We will not receive a renewal until February or March. So we have to make an estimate on what we think that increase will be. I've plugged in eleven percent. As we get closer to November when you have to make your final guideline. I'm hoping I'll have a little bit of information on, on what we might expect. But I, I believe I mentioned to you at the last meeting or a couple of meetings ago, we are self-funded through a, a cooperative of 16 communities. And the fund balance of the Minuteman Neshoba Health Group is much lower than it needs to be and so i it wouldn't surprise me if there is an extra percentage that is tacked on to the renewal in order to to build that fund balance because it is self-insured any claims first dollar up to six hundred thousand which is our reinsurance is paid by that trust and so we have to have um, a certain amount of money on hand to pay those claims. And our, our um, fund balance is at about 35% of what it should be. And it has remained that um, this past year end versus year end uh, a year ago, it, it's pretty consistent. And that has to be pre-funded, does it? That can't be funded as, uh, as needed on an as needed basis? Well, it... No, it can't. It would be difficult because because of the way towns operate, right? So we have to have a town meeting appropriation, and so, so it we have to. It has to be. Yes. It is predetermined, and on a monthly basis, we, we make um, premium payments. So, so does, does your eleven percent increase then for for the health insurance? Does that include an amount that you think you're going to ask for as? Yes, it does. it does, but it does not include any proposed new positions at, at this point in time. Um, I just interruption, do you have any idea what the total burden is for an employee? So if a new position is, uh, the salary is 100000 say, would it be 25%, 30%? Because in, I know in, in industry, when we hire people, we, we pretty much had a percent number in the back of our mind as far as a fully burdened right, you cost. Yes. Yeah. So do you have that percent available? That we, we typically use 30 percent. We may use 35 percent for public safety uh, because the the retirement benefit, the structure is different. That That's something we certainly could work on to come up with a hard calculation for that, but that's just you know, like a large portion of this initial request is salaries, and that would increase it significantly to, to know the full loaded cost. So, it's, it's a so the, the OPEB assessment, Chris, Chris touched on that. Um, that. That number that I'm using is based on what was contained in the 63017 valuation for fiscal 20. Uh, the retirement assessment is based on the 1118 valuation of the retirement system. That assessment still needs to be certified by the state. And hopefully within the next month, we will have that assessment certified. But I don't think, I think that number is, is pretty good. And those are the amounts that will keep us on the arc. Yes. Uh, right. The retirement um, system, as, as I just mentioned, the valuation is at the beginning of the calendar year, as of 1118, on an actuarial valuation, it was um, about 86% funded, and on a market value valuation, it was about 90% funded. So it's it's in great shape, but again, we, we are still on a... Um, 20, 2029 Well, the, the market value of the, value the assets, of the, the, assets the market value of the assets. 
And the market value, so we do, on an actuarial basis, you smooth the increases over a rolling four-year period. And on a market value, you're not smoothing those. You're just accounting for the increase or decrease in the valuation of the assets in that period of time. Um, <coughs> the discount rate used for liabilities, do you know what rate that is? For the uh, retirement system, it's 7%, and for the OPIB, it's 7.5%. That's been a discussion. So is that the discount rate or the expected return? Well, you know, that's when the discount the rate. Discount rate. So, when the conversation is some of that's been adjusted, but yeah. I thought the discount rate for it was paying all kids. We'll do it another time. At one, at one point, you had an actuary on this committee, and when yes. I used discount rate, he didn't like that. I can tell you the actuary, everybody I hear information from, they use those two things interchangeably. Well, and they so sort of, they're, they're very related. Right? We're bringing so the future liability the expected growth back to the present, so it's a discount. Right. But it's based it's on what you should have done. And that's why when we had it, it was in the cell. It was in the private sector. It's based on the ten year double A corporate bond rate. And that's what he was saying. Four of those are actuaries. That's what he was saying. Yes, and he wanted us to use the same thing. I'm sorry, I just tried to this is a discussion for another time. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, I, I can tell you our, the rate we use is, and I'm not, I'm not even going to collect it, I'm not going to call it. The rate we use is on the retirement system, it is on the low end of what retirement systems use. And in so terms of, thing. in terms of yes, what yes, we are earning on an annual basis, um, I, I can bring that in, but but our average is over seven percent. Over what period? Over. Well, we regularly track the ten-year period, uh, but I I think over the thirty-year period too. But I I can oh. I could get you that information. I know we. Yeah. The big corporations though are using about they're they use discount rate about one point five percent. And when Moody's does their, they put all the towns on the same footing, they use, I think, about 5%. So they, they would not use our valuation. They would go and they use their own. Yeah. They put everybody on the same footing. And I think you know, the discount rate they would use. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other fixed cost that I think is worth mentioning is the Minuteman Regional School Assessment. Um, you heard that presentation last week. That assessment is based on a, a rolling four-year enrollment uh, or conference share, any, any of the assessments. Um, what I understood them to say would result in about a two, I think a 2.25 student increase. And so if the way I calculated this is um, 2.25 2. times, I think I used 36 or $37,000, which is what they were showing per student. This is my rough calculation. I have not received anything from them yet, but as soon as I do, I will update that number. But that obviously is a significant increase, but, but it has to do with, with enrollment. Debt service is all based on existing schedules and a projection for what our new debt service will be based on our debt plan. And then the only, the only other piece is uh, down here, the state assessments. These are charges that we receive from the state for services that are provided by the state, such as um, the regional transportation, the, the, um, the train. Um, that, that, that would be the largest, but that's, that's what is included in there. Uh, we have a, a snow and ice deficit 
allowance of $175,000. And then we have our overlay um, account for abatements and exemptions at $550,000. So again, that, that would total all of those costs. Um, we, we talked about the 3.84% for the non-guidelines within budget. If you add in the non-guidelines, non-appropriated section, um, that, would, that would eat into the available revenue, 25.964 25, $25 million, leaving um, 83.8% available for guidelines and let's see down here if you just assume these are the three cost centers the, the town on the top CPS in the middle and the district on the bottom if you just assume you divvy up the money based on the proportionate share in fiscal 19 this is what would be available without um, eating into the levy the unused levy capacity any further or without any revenues over and above what have, has been projected already. Is this file of a size that you could circulate? Yes. Yeah, I can do that. And you said the debt service numbers that you included in that were the ones that we have here? Out of the, 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 pro the yeah. projection for new debt. Yep is on the, the eight and a half by 11 sheet, the debt one. plan, based on, based on the debt plan. Okay. Now in, in fiscal 20, we would be funding the, the 2018 plan. The plan generally funding the plan that was approved at the 2018 town meeting, last year's town meeting, and that's the first column. What's the six million? Right. Yes. Right. And that, that plan is particularly large because of the Giro, the purchase of the Giro property. Okay. So, so Carrie, if, uh, when I'm looking at the, the increase in the town budget, you keep it at, if it could only go up two point, was it six something percent? 2.67. Would be an increase of like six hundred and fifty thousand. And Chris yes. is asking for almost two million. So he so that wouldn't even cover the salary reserve fund. Okay. Well, look at the but percentage increase he's asking for. I know. I know. I'm just I'm just saying to keep it. There's a. Yeah. But is the million that he included there for salaries already included in some of your assumptions, or is that not? No. No, that's no it's because not, I, not the additional heads. The million that he's missing is the three percent. It's not. not because the only thing that I project at this point are the fixed costs. Okay. So and anything within uh, the operating budget is not plugged in. So I I think the one thing that I would point out is that that the town manager always brings to you a composite list of what is being requested right, right, right. without, wishes, without, we know without yeah, making yeah. Any, any evaluation at this point on whether or not he would include them in what he recommends. Yes. No, he's, he, he is the bad guy. Correct. Yeah, that is a killer. Yeah. I mean, that's a million by itself. And that alone said, puts it over. Seven. Right. Puts it right at 647, yeah. which yeah. Carrie's showing us. Right. Yeah. So we have a challenge. No, I think he has <laughs> <laughs> good, good, yeah. right. good comeback. Yeah. Wait, what was it? Ours is 647. If we go by Carrie's guideline, keeping the levy limit. Sure. And um, so we're giving him six, it allows 647, and he's coming right now. At that million. Yeah. Yeah. There are also every year there are deductions and uh, there are ways that the budget can be adjusted that hasn't been done in the presentation either. Right. No. no, you're right. It's still this early in the first, world. This is the wish. This is the wish. But that salary line is the This is right. this is the the list of requests from the department and it's food for thought for the finance committee, yeah. like what you yeah. heard last week and what you will hear next week to take into consideration when you make your decision about what you think the, the guideline increase should be. And then it's up to the, the managers 
the, the town manager and the superintendent to <coughs> figure out how to make it happen. So you'll send this out to us, Carrie? Thank you. Send it out to you. Any questions from people in the audience? Anyone? Questions, discussion? Uh, motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> Second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Thank you. 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 Thank you.